good afternoon students welcome to modern india class i'm teaching from a park right next to my home and because it's very sunny outside i'm going to wear my glasses and uh, this class will be taught with this whiteboard and marker right and uh, in this lecture about an hour and 15 minutes you will be taking notes because you will be answering after every lecture just for the participation grade and uh, there will be simple questions towards the end of the video and you will be answering that in the discussion board okay i'll start from where i left you and this process is going to continue until this coronavirus pandemic is over or they find a solution for it okay let's talk about where we left we talked about mogal empire right mogal empire and especially before mogal empire we talked about delhi sultanate but these are not fascinating as the mogal empire and i'll talk a little bit about mogal empire today and in the next lecture also i'll be talking a lot about mogal empire but today mogal empire and then i will move on to the british empire to show you how the mogal empire become the british empire and what the british empire did is what today's lecture okay i never done this long online class before but hey uh, necessities makes you do things and do new, new innovations let's start so we saw that there are okay let me see let me try this barber right oh my goodness barber can you see it barber mm. to humayun let me try with another marker one second just like in classes you got to improvise humayun yep this works humayun humayun and the third uh, emperor was jahangir i'm sorry akbar akbar the great right and fourth was jahangir babar again i write babar is the one who came and conquered from romber from uzbekistan to kabul kabul to india 1527 from the battle of panipat he defeated the lodi dynasty and we talked about that in the class jahangir and then sajahan and the sixth one after sajahan is aurangzeb right so i talked about akbar the great and why he was great he was very tolerant religiously he married into hindu rajput families right and he was open to all religious dialogues and jahangir his son was worried that he's not going to take the empire from akbar because akbar is living longer and longer he's almost living like 50 years after taking the reign so jahangir at the age of in his 30s wanted to take over the empire from akbar so he even decided to wage a war against his own father but akbar's mother and one of akbar's wife pacified akbar from not brutally um waging a war against jahangir and uh, made sure the power transmission happened smoothly without much conflict between father and son so jahangir took over power you, i talked about jahangir is the guy who loved jewelry like big pearls he wears and he was also a religious tolerant I remember these guys all three have canceled the jizya the tax the jizya 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 i'm writing without space bottom is the tax which is laid on non muslim uh, occupants under under the muslim rulers they abolished that and so they were religiously tolerant jahangir time is when the british came to india a very interesting thing so the british started a company called east india company right east india east india company east india company 
in 1600, 1600, they started this company at 1600 and came to India. And this is a charter they got from the British Queen. And some scholars say that is the first corporation in the world, first corporation, right? They have shareholders, everything. And they was just occupying one block in London. And they came all the way to India. Wait and see, they're going to take over the entire country of India. So they came to India and what did they do? So they were already Portuguese in India, right? The Malabar coast in the southern part. I drew Malabar coast in class. So in Malabar coast, maybe I'll draw it here. So if it's India, southern India, Malabar coast, there was Portuguese. There's a place called Goa. Goa, where the Portuguese were already colonized and they were settling down there. And so the, as already there were French in India, right? French were in Pondicherry, which is uh, Tamil Nadu, where a state I come from, Pondicherry. It's in the east of India, Pondicherry and Goa in the west of India. This is, Portu this is Portuguese colony, this is French colony. They were there. And the British came to, to India late to the game of colonization. And they wanted to go and meet Jahangir. And uh, why would they meet Jahangir? Well, they want to create a relationship so that they could do trade. They could get some privileges compared to these other guys to trade with the Mughal Empire, right? And so the guy who came to meet Jahangir is Sir Thomas, Thomas Rowe. So Thomas Rowe, this dude is a diplomat and he came and finally he get to meet Jahangir and he was impressing, tried to impress him with his gifts from England. He got a letter, so Thomas Rowe, the diplomat from King of England, right? And uh, so King James won and he got, the, he got this letter to show to Jahangir that they're here in good terms to do trade and well, um, Jahangir said, okay, you could stay in my palace. And he even got one of the ladies uh, of Indian, or Indian origin to get him married to Sir Thomas Rowe. And Sir Thomas Rowe was very impressed by the abundant wealth of Jahangir's empire. Yeah. And now you might think, okay, um, what did uh, Jahangir thought of the British, British empire, uh, British uh, uh, kingdom is nothing in wealth compared to Jahangir at the time. So Jahangir is like this mighty king, Badsha. They call him Badsha, Badsha B A like bad. <laughs> Shah. Badsha means like a big king, king of kings, and the, these are the rulers. And so Jahangir was also trying to have a good relationship with the British because he knows the British is a mighty naval force. So many of the Muslims uh, from India will go on a Hajj, a journey. Hajj is where the Muslims make a journey to Mecca and the Hajj. Hajj. It's a pilgrimage, religious pilgrimage. They go to Mecca in, um, once in a lifetime. So the British will be able to give safety, safeguards. You know, Mecca is in Saudi Arabia. We talked about it. Okay, so Jahangir <coughs> let Sir Thomas Rowe stay in his palace and it continued. But if you see Jahangir's rule and Sir Jahan's rule and the empire expanded because of the religious tolerance, I want to talk about, about the transition from Jahangir to Sir Jahan. How did it happen? Remember, there was no primogeniture like this uh, primogeniture. The word I mentioned in class, that means the firstborn takes everything. Sorry, I had to write, break the word because of this, there's no much space. Primogeniture, that means the first son gets everything of the father and the second, third gets nothing. That was the British and the European way of life. But this didn't have, Mughal Empire didn't have that. So Sajahan was not the first son. And he also wanted to be the ruler. Jahangir is getting to live longer and longer. So it's just like Sajahan as Jahangir fought against his father Akbar, Sah Jahan is now decided to fight against Jahangir, okay? He is waging a, uh, with a set of his own soldiers to fight against Jahangir. Jahangir sent his, 
this very tactical commander and beat Shah Jahan in the battlefield. Shah Jahan keeps running and hiding. Now, Shah Jahan has a wife, a wonderful wife named Mumtaj. Mumtaj is with him through thick and thin. And he, even when he's running away, at Shah Jahan, and he doesn't have power, he doesn't have money, and he is um, running away from the father to be not captured and killed. She was always with him supporting. Mumtaj. Mumtaj is spelled M U M T A J. Remember? Taj Mahal. It's going to come. So, Shah Jahan's story is eventually he has no way, and he sends a letter to Jahangir saying, like, I will try to make peace with you. I don't want to continue this fight. My life is miserable fighting you. So uh, Jahangir says, send me your sons, couple of them, and so that I could have them as like a hostage, but so that you won't do fight against me again. So Shah Jahan sends Aurangzeb, one of his sons, okay, and um, and another son, his, Shah Jahan's oldest uh, son is Tara, Tara Seko, okay, and he sends those two sons to Shah Jahan, okay, I'm sorry, Shah Jahan sends it to Jahangir. Now, Shah Jahan finally goes and takes over power after Jahangir passes over. What does he do? He fights and destroys all the other brothers and captures power. And when he becomes powerful as the emperor, he takes over power in Agra and his wife is with him and she lived. Did they live happily ever after? No, after a few years, Mumtaj passes away. And when Mumtaj passes away, Shah Jahan is so uh, depressed and then he decides to build a mausoleum for her in her honor um, to, to, to commemorate her. So then what happens? He, he brings the best builders from all over the world to build Taj Mahal. That's right. And uh, he does it with such, such uh, details that he not only built this with white marbles from different parts of India, but he brought stones, diamonds, pearls, all this. He was put in the building. That's right. And... And also he asked a Persian writer who does carving to come and write on the walls of Taj Mahal. The Persian writer said, I will be happy to come provided um, I get to sign my name in, in, at the bottom. So he was the only one allowed to sign his name in Taj Mahal. So Taj Mahal is built. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it was the best architecture. So remember Akbar was very tolerant Jahangir was tolerant, Shah Jahan was tolerant, and they were open to reading different literatures and ideas, and they were, empire is expanding, so the wealth is enormous. So Shah Jahan feels like, well, this place, this capital Agra is not big enough for me because I couldn't have large processions if I want. So he decides to build a big city Okay, and it's called Shah Jahanabad. So his name, Bad, that means like city of Shah Jahan. And, and that, that is now called the Delhi. The Delhi, um, the new Delhi is, is Shah Jahan Bad. And so he, he builds this and uh, so that he could reign in for long time right with this money and things but there's another problem coming for him that's Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb remember is not the oldest son huh? and the oldest son is what Shah Jahan loves a lot okay Tara Tara Seko. I already have mentioned him but here again Tara Seko is is just like Shah Jahan and his ancestors uh, beautiful literary scholar and he, he loves um, architecture just like his father the greatest architectural marvel Taj Mahal um, however Tarasiko is pampered and kept in the palace 
whereas for any conflict around the empire, Aurangzeb was sent around. Aurangzeb went fighting wars throughout the empire and so he was battle hardened as they say he was ready and he wants to take over power when he heard the news that sajahan is sick he thought okay sajahan is dead and this older brother is hiding it to take over the empire and he decided that he is going to go all the way marching to the capital of mughal empire and take over power as the emperor and he aurangzeb had another brother so he aurangzeb put a connection with the other brother to fight tarasiko so they two joined together to fight tarasiko in the battle and sajahan is still alive he was sick but he's still alive sajahan blesses tarasiko to go him and fight the battle but tarasiko so men even though large in number they didn't have battle experience like aurangzeb aurangzeb has ton of experience fighting that's what he does that's what he does the best he, and he is not a scholar all this i'll talk about darzim soon uh, in detail about his characters he defeats tarasiko's army because tarasiko in the battle sitting in an elephant an arrow hits him and he falls down and he tries to get on on a horse but people with him looks up the elephant and the, it was empty they thought oh the king is dead the prince is dead so they start running and it was a riot aurangzeb army destroyed it tarasiko runs back to his father and tries to uh, find a way out of this problem because aurangzeb is coming now to the palace uh, to kill tarasiko tarasiko runs through the back door out and sajahan completely protects himself in the fort with with um, uh, closing the fort aurangzeb comes there and put a siege siege or you could call it siege siege g uh, that means surrounding the fort and not letting anyone from outside uh, go anywhere or get food or water in fact the water supply to the fort was through a river right yamuna is the river next to if you see even taj mahal photos there's a river next to it that's the yamuna river that river is sending water into the fort for sajahan and sajahan was completely uh, the river was stopped by aurangzeb so he diverted the flow so the water is not going so out of thirst sajahan is drinking from the muddy water in the inside the fort and he is writing to his son a good muslim son will not let his father not drink water and aurangzeb says well you are not a good muslim father to let me have my my rule you you sent your other son to fight against me now you got to give give him back finally the fort opens up because they cannot uh, live without water for a long time how long could they just drink dirty water and survive so finally when they opens up aurangzeb takes over power and he sends men looking for tarasiko in other places tarasiko runs and surrenders uh not surrenders goes and uh gets help from a small king and uh, stays with them but that guy who gave he said i will help you to tarasiko betrays him and gets him to aurangzeb aurangzeb finally arrests tarasiko his own older brother and guess what he does he removed all his fancy clothes put him in tattered clothes and put him on an elephant a tiny small elephant and made that elephant roll in mud and it was dirty looking elephant and put him a, like a broken ugly looking crown on tarasiko's head put him on top of that elephant and make him parade through the capital agra right that's where the taj mahal is mughal empire's capital agra the streets he was going through in such a sad fashion that made all the people of the town cry and weep because they just loved tarasiko he was a nice dude tarasiko also is very very scholarly and a thoughtful man a poet and the scholars say like modern scholars say if tarasiko was ruling mughal empire instead of aurangzeb 
it could have been an Indian renaissance, but it didn't happen. And guess what he, uh, Aurangzeb did with Tarasiko? He killed them after that uh, period. He killed them and he took the head of Tarasiko in a plate and took it to his father, Shah Jahan, and showed him. It's really cruel what he did. And Shah Jahan couldn't handle the sadness. Already he lost his wife, he's sitting there. Aurangzeb completely put um, Shah Jahan in a house arrest. In a house arrest, he gave him a small place and very little money to live on. And uh, and he, he didn't even get to have his regular visitors or go out in his whims and fancies, no. So Aurangzeb just stayed there in the house arrest in a small place so that he could have a view of the Taj Mahal that he built for his wife. You know who was helping Shah uh, um, uh, Jahan? Um, Shah Jahan was helped in the house of arrest to buy Shah Jahan's daughter, Shah Jahan's daughter. And uh, that Shah Jahan's daughter stayed with um, Shah Jahan till Shah Jahan's death. Even when he got very old, he kept the mirror um, next to him and the reflection of Taj Mahal he could see because he couldn't move and go and sit in the balcony to look at Taj Mahal. And he lived in the memories of his wife and died there. Aurangzeb completely didn't give his father because he felt angry that his father, Shah Jahan, didn't love him as much as he loved Tarasiko. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, dramatic story. But guess what Aurangzeb did? Aurangzeb kept fighting, that's what he's good at, and expanding his empire. Despite um, expanding his empire, he, he fought with many, many different uh, people. One of his nemesis was Shivaji, okay? Shivaji, a uh, Hindu king. This Shivaji is from Maratha, Maratha. So if you go to Bombay, the city now in India, Bombay, big city in India, the airport is named after Shivaji. The train station there is named after Shivaji. And Shivaji was even arrested by Aurangzeb. Arrested, um, defeated one time, captured, and was incarcerated. And when he got incarcerated, he escaped through dirty cloth pile laundry somehow. And he, before escaping, he asked Aurangzeb, uh, please let me go. I won't rebel and fight against you. I will go and spend the rest of my life as a saint, Hindu saint, because Sivaji is Hindu. Aurangzeb is Muslim, right? Hindu saint. And Aurangzeb wrote him back a letter saying like, well, you could convert to Islam and uh, I will help you be, um, give you allowances till you die and people to take care of you and you will be a Muslim saint. Sivaji said, no, that wouldn't do for me. So finally he escaped Sivaji and he, you know what he did? He went through a long path because he knows people, Aurangzeb men are looking for him. He, he didn't directly go to his Maratha empire. He went through a long routed path to reach his place and started again giving hard time fighting to Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was so angry that Sivaji is creating so much problem for him. Sivaji had a big image of uniting the entire Marathas uh, together. Um, and Aurangzeb, uh, our, our other Hindu rulers did not have such big empire ideas, whereas Sivaji had a big vision of an empire. Okay, so many of the right-wing conservative politicians of modern times in India um, are big fan of Sivaji, okay, uh, who stood against Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb lived long, just like the, his ancestors, especially the Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, he lived long. But guess what? What about with his children and things? He has put in jail three of his children for different violations. He's so strict in terms of religious practice. He didn't indulge in any of life's um, natural things, okay? Because many of the other guys before Aurangzeb have like addictions like alcohol, opium, and women, Jahangir, but not Aurangzeb. is very religious 
and he is he will read quran regularly and he brought that stit the sternness into his iron fist rule as well he didn't want any of the jizya the tax um, not being laid on the hindus he said jizya should be brought back and he taxed double double the hindus and that actually created problems in his empire and so the his empire was getting weakened even the mughal empire is getting weakened even in his lifetime because of his intolerance for religion of other religions especially the majority hindus are the majority mughals are the muslim minorities still he was very rigid and then when he died in 1707 that was the biggest size the empire mughal empire was it started to decline after aurangzeb see 1707 right 1707 he was in 1707 he died and the british are already is there british was there in uh, um aurangzeb's grandfather jahangir's time but they're slowly waiting for their opportunity and they're doing business right they're doing business not still a political power right but by 1757 from 1707 aurangzeb died 1757 just 50 years the mughal empire started declining dramatically so many rulers came in between that and none of them were effective and by the 1757 there was uh, there was this um, battle battle of plassey you should know this battle this important battle of plassey battle of plassey this was a battle fought in 1757 in bengal remember bengal is a very wealthy wealthy place Bengal is a very wealthy um, province in India right and there was a nawab the ruler of Bengal N A W A B nawab of Bengal was ruling it and the british from one of the weak aurangzeb's descendants one of the rulers mogal empire in in agra got a right a permission to collect taxes in bengal they are they are businessmen they are not rulers they can't collect taxes but they went there with that the nawab of bengal was challenged by the british for a fight for war but nawab of bengal has a large army he has large number of cannons and he had french allies supporting him so the british it's almost impossible to defeat them in battle correct the british side the man who led the fight is called robert clive this guy this guy i'll tell you about this guy robert clive this guy bribed the commander in chief of nawab of bengal commander in chief the main commander in chief the main military guy the top military general he bribed and robert clive the nawab of bengal did not know that so when they get into the battle boom the the commander in chief switched sides with robert clive and nawab of bengal was easily defeated in the battle and the french allies were defeated so now guess what the british took over power power political power before they were business people if i have to give you a modern analogy you know apple right i'm i'm recording this whole thing in the apple phone Apple if you look at back of the phone it says like designed in California the company is in California imagine apple a company a corporation suddenly taking over the political power of California kicking out the governor of California and taking absolute power not like democratic absolute power and then ruling and taxing the people of California and getting money out of it that's exactly what the british did Bengal is a very wealthy province way richer than England right imagine india was 25% of the world's economy the entire europe was not even 25% of the world's economy 
any British definitely were not 25% of the world's economy. And so now Robert Clive is at the top of the pile and all the money is siphoned. He becomes super wealthy. He is become the wealthiest English in India. And he took all this money, went to England and bought so many things, including politicians in parliament, right? And now East India Company, right, is doing lobbying, lobbying. Some of you know what lobbying is, others might not. So I'll explain what lobbying is. Lobbying. You see this? Lobbying. Lobbying happens even in the American Congress. You know what, what the rich companies do? They send lawyers, individuals to go and contact these congressmen who are in the US Congress and talk to them so that they could help them get loopholes in taxes or benefits that will benefit the company, benefit the company which the lobbyists are representing. So you might think, why would the congressman do that favor for this lobbyist? Because the lobbyists could get the congressman money to run for office. You know, every time congressmen have to run, they need to raise money. The companies give them money. So I think one of the um, uh, books I was reading talked about for every dollar the lobbyists spend, they make like $200, $200 plus dollars profit. That's no business you could make that kind of money, right? And so the lobby, and why did I say this? The East India Company become the first lobbying. They started lobbying British Parliament. So what would they get? They will get enormous powers to do things they want in India with the help of Crown of England. That's right. So 1757, this battle happened and he took over by 1760s. They took over power took over power in Calcutta officially and started taxing, taxing Calcutta. Now, with the, all this revenue, they could raise their British army larger. It is not just the British who were, the officers were the British. All the soldiers, foot soldiers were Indians who were getting paid to fight for the British against Indian kings, other Indian kings. So from keeping, say, the Apple to take over California, now using California, California is the largest state uh, in the contiguous states uh, with the abundant wealth. It's like seventh largest economy in the world. And if you just put California alone, if they use California Apple, now they could take over one by one each of the states, right? That's how the British Empire started growing. They started fighting with the, the Rajputs, the Rajputs, and the Bharat empires and all this, and they were able to subdue them. And they also started doing something called divide and rule. Divide and rule. What is divide and rule? Divide and rule is if all these princely uh, kings unite together against the British, they're gonna kick them out like this. They wouldn't let them unite. They will divide them. They will create create uh, enmity between them. The British will give titles to um, the kings who are ruling. They will uh, bribe them to support the British side. They will work with a, a, a prince and together they will go and fight another prince who is ruling. So by that, they could take over one by one, one by one, one by one, okay? This was going. Now, I wanted to talk about the British rule. Let me have some water, hang on. How do they collect taxes? The British collected taxes using people called Jamindars. Jamindars, who are these Jamindars? Jamindars are for every small villages. These are like landowners, Jamindars. It's spelled like that, Jamindars landowners they owned lands and they will collect taxes from the peasants and funnel that money all the way to the Mughal Empire it was there even in the Mughal Empire 
but the Jamin, but the British rule made it much more stricter collecting taxes. So they started raising the taxes on the peasants 15 to 20 percent, okay, um, of of uh, money from whatever the people make 15 to 20 percent they have to pay as tax, and the Jamindas get to retain very less compared to what they used to retain during the Mughal Empire. So they started making enormous money taxing the British. And they used that money for what? For soldiers, one of the things. Uh, so they recruited more soldiers, built more army. So basically to rule India, they used Indian money right, to rule India using Indian soldiers. What a, what a master plan, evil plan, huh? And so uh, they, how did they control the population in general? They had to write laws. If you're ruling, imagine you're, uh, you're ruling California Apple, they have to write laws now, right? Because they are absolute power. So laws to write, they just followed bookish people. Bookish people means the religious clerics and the priests, Hindu priests. So you know the Brahmins are the top caste. Right? The Brahmins, the Brahmins have no the religious Hindu religious codes. Brahmins, and so they, the Brahmin priests were recruited to work for the British and use that money to 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 pay for them pittance. They paid for them so that they could write the laws that will be used against the British, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, against the Hindu people. And then Muslim clerics were recruited for to use Islamic law to control the Muslims. Now, what the British didn't know is things are changing. Things were changing in the society, but the British didn't care. They just applied the these laws, the old system of Hindu and Muslim laws. For example, things were changing, like uh, Hindu women started slowly inheriting property and British still didn't recognize it because they were still in the old system of what the Brahmins said, right? And they were doing it. And they also, what made them rule Indians? What gives them the right to rule, right? You might think that, like, what? What makes them think that they could be rulers? Well, the superiority complex. How do they get that superiority? See, they said Aryans, they have a race theory. This is like freaking idiotic race theory. The race theory is that so all these lectures, I'm, um, the British lecture especially I'm doing, I had to give credit where credit is due. Uh, if you want to read more on this, check out um, British Rule in India, Great Courses, Lectures in Audible. Uh, it's a fantastic source, but uh, you don't need to spend hours and hours. Um, if, you, um, if you're not interested, you could read on different books. I will recommend throughout and I will put it on Blackboard as well. However, I'm going to summarize it here wonderfully for you to take with you some good points. Uh, about the British rule. So the race theory is that if you are living in a cold environment, that's correct, it's crazy. The colder your environment, you are martial. Martial means like soldierly. It's called martial theory, right? The racial superiority comes from martial theory. So if you live in a cold environment, you get to be braver so i come from south right i i come in india south south india which is warm that means the british won't think we are brave it's idiotic even though there were many brave kings in the south and so that's not it they also think that your race how if you're aryan you are better okay and then you might ask wait a minute is indian some of them were mixed with aryan race right because we talked about in the beginning of the semester that Aryans came and mixed. Aryan itself means, I'll remind you, it's a noble people, right? Iran is called the land of Aryans, right? A land of noble people, Iran means. So isn't that Indians are, many of them are Aryans? Yeah, 
but the Buddhist said, yeah, however, your ability to be taught by the totem pole goes down if you are practicing many gods, like polytheism. India was practicing many gods. If you have monotheism, which is one god, which they wear, the British wear, then you will be a better. If you're practicing politician, even if you're Aryan, it goes down. The Hindus, Aryans, right? So because they were practicing many gods, they go down in rank. This is ridiculous. This is basically to rule the uh, out of greed. They just want to justify. So they created these theories to justify their rule, okay? And um, they, they did stop Sati, you know Sati, the woman dying in a fire um, where her husband's body is cremated. They did um, put laws to stop it. Okay, Sati, the Hindu practice came from Rig Veda. Yeah, and by the way, Akbar also. We talked about Akbar also didn't want Sati to be practiced by the Hindus, and he did uh, completely forbidden it. And the British created laws. And, but it, Sati is practiced, especially in the top Hindu caste, not in lower levels. Um, so that being said, they created how to rule India, three things, three things you should know. One is train tracks. They created the third largest railways in the world. And you might think that's wonderful. They did that to Indians. They did that, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll write down all the three reasons uh, and why they did that. The second one, they built a lot of telegraph lines. Okay, so information from England will come to India in five hours rather than it used to be five months. When, remember, when the first British came to meet Jahangir, at the time it will take five months or more for information from England to come. It'll take five hours because of telegraph. And the train tracks, they laid so many train tracks. And then post postal system. Post postal system. Okay. And and you might think, oh they did all this. Isn't it that uh, is to improve India? No, it's to move soldiers. Two hundred thousand men were under the British rule um, as soldiers millions of Indians, but 200,000 soldiers ready to go and put down rebellion anywhere if it happens. So there's 200,000 needs, train transportation, boom, could be one from one place to another to put down rebellion. Telegraph, so information could be passed. Hey, there's a rebellion. And postal system to rule, they need regular postage, the British Raj. They call it the British Raj. It's a lot of paperwork, right? They're ruling through laws created by the religious clerics of Hindus and Muslims, and they are sending paperwork everywhere. And so you need postal system. Other than these three, you know what else they did? Other than these th three, the train, telegraph, and postal, they created education system. Now you might think, oh, isn't that good for the Indians? The education system is not to educate them so well that the educated population will challenge the British. No, education on things which they need worker bees for the British Empire. So you need worker bees to fulfill this big bureaucracy the British Raj is creating, right? So they are doing that. And so they created this education system. Now, 1757, Battle of Flossy. I'm going to make you easily remember. I've been telling you stories. Stories are the ways you could remember things easily, right? Something happened in 1857 in India. 1857. Okay, this is important. This is all 57, 57. Again, later in our lecture, we'll talk about 1957. Three important dates: 1757, 1857, 1957. The 1757, this battle of Plassey, they took over in Bengal, and from there, slowly, they are taking over power. In 1857, 
something important happen it's called according to some scholars there's multiple names the first war of independence indians independence okay and it's also called urban uprising okay and let me talk about and it's also called sepoy mutiny there are different words sepoy mutiny first war of independence i don't need to spell it you know how to spell it first war of independence or sepoy mutiny or urban uprising what this is is sepoys what does that word mean sepoy means these are soldiers remember the indian soldiers working for the british and indian men who are recruited as soldiers and working for the british they are there they are called sepoys the these soldiers are either hindus or muslims now the bullet cartridges which they are trained with they had to bite it bite it and put it in the gun when they biting this bullet cartridges these cartridges were alleged made by fat of the pigs and the cows and you might think what's the big deal about it the big deal is hindus don't eat cow muslims don't eat pigs now you're asking them to bite that it's a taboo it's a religious taboo and so um, they didn't want to do it so a mutiny started an uprising against the british empire now that while that thought is there i have to say still the mughal empire is there remember aurangzeb dies and there are a lot of small 1707 there are small rulers still ruling small uh, descendants of him and the last ruler who was ruling at 1757 his name is bahadur shah bahadur shah this bahadur shah is also called jafar 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 okay this guy is 80 almost years old and he just like his ancestors are a beautiful poet a calligrapher that means you know beautiful writing they do in that and he just sits and enjoys his life he knows he doesn't have much power now because the british he has to get permission to do everything from the british he lives in delhi right and uh, there's a Br british officer there who he has to matt cliff his name he has to ask permission from him to do anything even though in name bahadu shah is the emperor he doesn't have real power he's like a caged bird he even wrote poetry he's a poet too right he writes poetry about his powerless position he lives that he's like a caged bird okay and this bahadu shah he still has his palace he still has um harm like women and uh, there and but at 80 and um, he he doesn't have the powers his ancestors had so he is sitting there eating mangoes enjoying the moonlight living life and this uprising started around him many of the people who fought for the independence came to delhi and said hey old man we make you a king now okay and guess what the the british started to fight back so the indian rebels completely went out of the way and killed civilians in this in this mutiny indian soldiers who rebelled killed british civilians that is the wives of the officers children they were all killed uh, in a region and that gave the british a big um cause belly i could say cause of war they they used full iron fist to put down that mutiny in 1857 
they even blasted many Hindus they captured in front in, in, in put them in, in front of a cannon and blow them into pieces and hung them they said like hang them with the um, pig and cow in their mouths hung them and they killed them see if all Indians rebelled the British wouldn't have been able to handle they would have ran away but it is only some princely states supported even the rebellion you will see a video next next week most of them did not support even the king Jafar didn't even know the rebellion was going on until very late so Jafar was arrested by the British arrested and tried in a British court in India a British judge sentenced him to be deported to another country so they they took Jafar handcuffed him he is just like the sad eight-year-old man taken to Burma B-U-R-M-A which is a country next to India which the British ruled Burma Rangoon it's called at the time and guess what they did they he incarcerated in a room for a couple of years they killed Zafar the king's sons right the British and after a couple of years the king died when they took out his body and dug a burial ground outside and buried there without bringing any people to see or watch and put limestone in it why limestone so that the body decays faster and completely gets rid of everything and completely unauthorized burial ground for the Mughal emperor's last emperor that's what the British did okay so they now the 1857 completely changed the dynamics in India they completely went on to disarm all the Indians because you can't have rifles you cannot have any um, swords and other things you have to get permission um, so why because they are afraid if the Indians again rebel the British will be killed so they just want to disarm all the Indians in India and meanwhile when the Queen of England hear this what happened to the British citizens the East India Company was kicked out kicked out means they don't have power anymore to rule the crown rule came to India crown the British that is okay let me put it this way Apple is taking over state by state ruling California and then Nevada and a few other states now suddenly uh, name a country England Queen decided to rule America that's right they take over crown so 1857 onwards after the rebellion 1857 onwards the Queen take over power to rule India and things changed now what did they do they were very a couple of things they were very sensitive to how to handle this Indian Kings before there was a doctrine called um, lapse doctrine of lapse that is the British British if say if I'm a king Indian King and I don't have a son not a daughter a son to rule then they will take over my empire after my death I cannot adopt a child and make him a king or queen or king so they would come and they're looking anytime when somebody doesn't have a son they're like oh I'm getting a chance Th these are the things they did before 1857 the British now after 1857 the crown decided to rule through proxy rule through proxy that is ruled indirectly you could write it down indirect rule indirect rule means they want the kings in India to rule but they are ruled by the British crown so to put it that 
this way it is cheaper for the British. Why is it cheaper? Because they don't need to do all the jobs of ruling, but they could collect money from the king which is ruling. The kings who are ruling each of these princely states have to pay money to the British. If they don't, if they don't, they will be overthrown. So the movie you watch, uh, Lagan, uh, for this week will show you how these kings which are ruling princely states have been given titles. You know how crazy that is? Napoleon Bonaparte said that men will die for ribbons. Okay? People are just titles given by these guys from other outside their country. They long for their titles. They competed for the titles. Competed among the other princes to get the title from the from the British. So the British used that and ruled India indirectly by giving titles and also taking money to them. Uh, and the crown was getting richer. And guess what? They took everything India could afford back to Great Britain, including, remember in Taj Mahal building, there were stones, precious stones all around. Um, put in the building, all were taken out by the British to in, to their country. There were even, one scholar I recently read talked about the British thinking about destroying Taj Mahal completely. And uh, uh, one of the wise British persons said, no, we shouldn't destroy it. Then the other British officer said, maybe we should dismember Taj Mahal into pieces, ship it to England and put them together in England. And the other said, no, we shouldn't do that. So now they were they were destroying the cultural elements and you know Kohinoor diamond, which is the most expensive diamond. It's a very expensive diamond held by the Mughal emperors. It's like this big diamond was taken to England and it's still now even in the Queen's crown in the crown, okay? Uh, the Kohinoor diamond is taken from India. So the British um, started ruling India indirectly, and they started a way of ruling through a service it's called, um, Indian Civil Services, ICS. Indian Civil Services, what is that? These are, people who are administrators of different districts. Districts. So you could say Manhattan could be a district, okay? And this will be ruled by an officer who gets, he has to pass an exam. Less than 4% of Indians qualified to be these officers. The ones who rule that province are administrator, I should say, the district is called collector, collector of taxes. They collect taxes, so they're collectors. And these exams were held in England, and so Indians, one, had to afford to go and write these exams. Two, they were kicked out for racial reasons in different ways. One guy was failed in the exam because of coughing, coughing, can you believe it? Just because he coughed, he was kicked out. Them. And so most of the officers, 96%, were British. And now this services is in India still. The government rules. Of course, it's a democracy. Politicians govern. But this ICS officers still do the job of helping the politicians govern. So the British were the ones which were governing India and ruling it and using these officers. There are three different levels important ones I want to say in modern India like right now in democracy this is IFS that means Indian Foreign Service and then IAS that means Indian Administrative Service and then IPS then it's Indian Police Service and then this is a Forest Service Indian Forest Service is the fourth IFS Foreign Service Indian Administrative Service these are the collectors IPS is the police officers, police service, and then forest service. These are the four ways they administer India even now.
This is a system created by the British during the British rule. So now it's almost an hour of lecture. So I'm gonna stop here and I will be putting some questions so that you could watch and learn. Answer, good luck.